something magical. It was like the whole world was, was here. Uh, they closed historic Main Street to cars. So it was just a, a pedestrian plaza. And you just hear languages from all over the world as you walked up and down the street. Um, so there, yeah, there's, there are a lot of amazing things that happen here in this little town. Hello, welcome to this episode of The Hip Spotlight. Today we're talking to Lisa Needham and Rich Wyman, singers, songwriters, performers, and band leaders from Park City, Utah. Lisa is an actor and a monologuist, as well as a vocalist whose pop style incorporates elements of jazz, blues, and American musical theater. Rich is a singer and a piano player with a long and varied solo career that includes many world tours and a second album produced by the late Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Eddie Van Halen. Lisa spent many years as a singer in Rich's band, and they decided to team up and first in a group called Park 88, referencing both Rich's instrument in the city that they're from, and more recently as Rich Nyman and Lisa Needham, they put out several singles uh, and toured theaters across the country in support of the Gypsy Kings. Uh, uh, it's nice to see you both. Thank you for, for uh, talking to me today. I appreciate it. Thanks that. for having us, Tris. What, uh, I, I like to find out about the intersections between people's musical careers and where they're from and what's important to them. Uh, what brought you both to Park City? Are, are you skiers? Um, do you, <laughs> no, no, really. I grew, I grew up skiing since uh -huh. I was young. And then... Not he, so much me. Not so much, but he started skiing. And we actually came here on a trip with a friend who wins everything. And she <laughs> won a trip for four, <clears throat> everything. Uh, you have a friend that wins everything, yes. Rentals, you name it, and yeah, we, brought us. We were living in New York City at the time. That's where we met. And uh, it, was, it was a trip for four from New York to Park City. That's how we discovered Park City, on a ski trip. And one night we crashed a bar and he got up and played the piano and the owner said, hey, you want to come back and play for the summer? And, and so I went back to New York, got my motorcycle, and rode out here on my motorcycle. Uh huh. <laughs> and um, I spent <laughs> I spent the summer playing at the old train depot in Park City from the 1860s, I think. And they had a piano, and it was just a blast. Uh, and fell in love with uh, this town. Went back to New York, uh, recorded my first album brought Lisa with me for that ski season of 91 and we had a round trip ticket and we never used the return. Uh-huh. Yeah, we were like let's just stay for the ski season and see what it's like cuz I loved it too. I uh I grew up skiing in Vermont. I think I just had this idea that ski towns were the coolest places in uh -huh. the world and I think I always wanted to live in one. In look, Park, look what we manifested. Yeah, in Park City, that was 30 years ago. You know, Park City was a lot cooler then. It wasn't uh, um, the multi, multi million dollar mansions all over the place. Uh, Sundance Film Festival hadn't blown up. The Olympics mm -hmm. hadn't come. It was still a very cozy, small, cool, um, great little town. You know? Still is. We still love it. Yes. Uh, so Lisa was uh, where in Vermont did you grow up? Place in Sugarbush. Ah, yes. Okay. All right. And well, then Sugarbush bought Glen Ellen, was it? And became Sugarbush and Sugarbush North and Jersey City. So I'm been Jersey all the way. Um, Princeton. I, Princeton. I love Princeton. It was just in Princeton yesterday. Yeah. Uh, Jersey. Um, uh, Jersey is not really a ski spot, um, but no. my understanding is that uh, Park City is now the number one ski spot in in america that if you really and that the skiing there is considered to be uh on the level of any skiing any place in the world and in addition to sundance and the olympic history 2002 and it looks likely that utah's gonna get the olympics again which would be more action for park city it's a small town that punches incredibly high incredibly far above its weight. I mean, that is really extraordinary when you think about it. And it yeah. must be a very singular place to make music. It must be a very interesting place to interact with fans uh, and to base yourself, base all of your activities out of. Uh, I could see getting getting 
you know, a, a place that you might fall in love with. So much must have changed in the past 30 years because yet you've seen change. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, when we moved here, um, I played like seven nights a week during the ski season, sometimes two times a day. I mean, uh -huh. there was so much work for a musician. And there still is. There's, there are a lot of places that have musicians. Uh, every hotel, restaurant, bar, you know, there's live music in a lot of places. And that's really what uh, also kept me here. Um, and then during, you know, um, during Sundance, the, the whole world uh, creatively kind of comes here, you know? So it's, there's a lot of creative energy here. The last 10 days of January every year. And um, we've played a, a million shows during Sundance. Um, there's, there are a lot of creative people here. Um, and uh and the olympics as well you know when the olympics came um we opened up for alanis morissette the goo goo dolls um plus i did 24 uh events throughout the olympics uh, corporate events um <coughs> they had stages all over the place it was really magical it was like the whole world was, was here uh they closed historic main street to cars so it was just a, a pedestrian plaza and you just hear languages from all over the world as you walked up and down the street. Um, so there, yeah, there's, there are a lot of amazing things that happen here in this little town. The town itself has not changed population wise. Uh -huh. It's still a town of 8,000 people, same as it was when we moved here, but the surrounding County summit County, oh, wow. there was nothing out there, but farms. Now there's about 40,000 people living in the surrounding county. There are so many musicians that you talk to who uh, in the city who openly fantasize about an escape to the mountains. Uh, that it's something that they think about, like, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if we could do this? But frequently they feel like they either can't do it because of the ties that they have in New York or financially it's hard for them. How were you able to afford to, to make the jump to Utah? Was it really because there was so much demand for the music or, or was it, or did you feel like, or, or were you really throwing the dice on it? I mean, how secure was it when you made the leap from a place like New York to a place with 8,000 8, people? Well, for him, pretty much, you know, in New York City, you, you end up, or you did, end up paying to play somewhere, you mm -hmm. know? It wasn't like you really got paid to play in Park City, he was getting paid seven nights a week yes. to perform. Um, so it was pretty lucrative and it wasn't as expensive to live in Park City then as mm -hmm. it is now. So, um, and just the quality of life was different. We were both living in New York. I, that's where we met and it just was, you know, it was fun, but it was kind of a rat race, you uh -huh. know. Yes. Counting money in the couch and, you know, collecting money that <laughs> fell behind the couch. You know, we were young. We were in our early 20s and um, we saw this place and just decided to come out for a couple months. And, you know, it was I would say it was pretty lucrative for him. Yeah, it was interesting. You know, Tris, when when I, I got out here for that summer, that first summer, um, I rode out on my motorcycle um, it was like a grand adventure. I'd never really been anywhere between New York and LA. Uh -huh. you know, there was like this vast United States that nobody ever sees. And um, I came, I rode out on my bike. I remember I rode straight up to the depot, which was on Main Street. And I started playing the next night and I play every week, Thursday through Sunday. That first weekend, it was kind of empty, but great cozy vibe. But then the... Um, the local newspaper came and did interviewed me and on the front of their art section, they did a full page story uh -huh. about me coming out from New York and playing. And from that next weekend through the end of the summer, it was packed every weekend. The radio station was playing my music. It was like this little microcosm of fame uh -huh. suddenly in this little town. And I was getting paid and and the audience was changing every week because it's a yes. Well, that's the other thing I always say. You know, I've played in Las Vegas, 
I've played here. When you play in a resort area, the audience changes every week, so which which is awesome. Um, so I went, we, I went back to New York and like I went back to, I was a bike messenger. I was bike messengering. I was playing on the weekends um, down um, near New Hope, Pennsylvania. And uh, it was, I longed to get back to Park City for uh -huh. sure. It got under my skin. You know, Utah does that. Utah gets under your skin. And um, so uh, it was, uh, it was kind of tough going back to New York City to the, the rat race uh, life. Um, and when we came back out to Park City, uh -huh. that second win for that winter, um, like I said, I was playing every night of the week. Yes. Plus I was playing at Prey Skis. The money was just pouring in. And then the following winter of 92 is when I met Eddie Van Halen. Mm -hmm. So I really had only been here like a year when that happened. And that just, um, everything moved out to LA at that point, you know? Yes. Well, we didn't, no, we didn't move out to LA. No, no. It's yeah. But musically. Musically things, things, things musically moved conceptually to in the direction of Los Angeles. Yeah, and, you know, sometimes it probably happens to a lot of people who have the Park City experience through through Sundance, though maybe not quite as much with music. I mean, I imagine that uh, your music is your music feels very physical. When you see the videos, it's very physical. The performances are physical. Uh, it, it is it's rock music that takes place in time. You're playing you're playing with a certain amount of aggression, although it's melodic music. And, and I, I do think that I wonder whether whether the influence of being in a place where there are so many people um, who are doing athletic activities, whether they're people who are skiing or out all the time, is there something that you feel about Utah that you're, that a song like Forgiveness really connects with? Just your approach, did it change the way you, you, you make music being there? I, 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 I'm not sure if places change the music I make. I, the people that I'm with definitely has a big impact. You know, who I'm, the musicians I'm working with have an impact on the music that I write. Um, so um, whether Park City has an impact? Um, well, quality of life uh, surely has the, an impact on everything, I would think. I, I think the pace of life in Park City, which is a little slower, Mm -hmm. um, um, that might have an impact and allow you to, to, to write maybe less frenetic music. Um, uh, I think that, uh, um, it allows you to really kind of get into a space. Um, not that I couldn't do that in New York. Um, but, uh, for example, you know, writing the song forgiveness, it was a very, um, very quick process. The whole thing took a uh, half hour, 45 minutes for the whole song to come out. Um, you know, it was really just hitting how I mm -hmm. felt on the head, getting into the zone, getting into a groove and just pouring that out. Um, it was more an inspiration. It was an inspiration of the relationship that Lisa and I have, you know? Um, and uh, so, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question or not, but uh, I yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, a song like "Fugitive Dust," for instance, uh, I think is a song that seems like it was, it, it's 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 grounded in you know, quite literally in the soil of the place that you're from. It's like it, it is in a way in a way a kind of a message song. It's something that oh, yeah. you kind of want to want to say about the place that you're from and the connection and, and the effect that it's had on you, perhaps. Um, and uh, you know. Uh, tell me a little bit about writing that song and the connection that and and what and what you were trying to say about about where you were the the ground ground listeners in the history of of the of the place uh, which is well, an interesting park, place parks park city um was created by uh william randolph hearst mm -hmm. actually made his fortune here in the silver mines so back in the late 1800s mid to late 1800s um they built mines here and they mined silver uh, but in the process of doing that, um, they dumped toxic soil all over the place. So for a hundred years, they didn't care. They just dumped it everywhere. And yeah. now, now they didn't know any better. Yeah. yeah, they didn't know any better. So now that this, the Park City has become this world famous resort and people live here, 
they're literally living in a toxic area. Uh-huh. And any time, and so what happened was a couple of years ago, I've been involved in a lot of causes. That's uh-huh. one of the things that I also love about Park City, Tris, is going to city council meetings and speaking to the mayor and the city council. And you get a few people and you get involved in issues and you can actually make change uh-huh. in a small town. And this issue that came up was the mayor and the city council were trying to fast track a hazard... <laughs> <clears throat> a hazardous waste site right as you come into into park city uh-huh. so you got this beautiful mountain vista and they wanted to put a hazardous waste site there to dump this toxic soil so as people are building hotels and houses and they dig up the earth they got to move it and dump it there and me and a bunch of other people including the former mayor and the current summit county counselor and a bunch of environmental activists began protesting the proce- process And in my research, I spoke with the executive director of Heal Utah, which is the Healthy Healthy Environmental Alliance of Utah Uh based in Salt Lake City. And he was discussing the problem of fugitive dust. And I said to him, wait a second, what did you say? He said, fugitive dust. I said, that sounds like the name of a band. I love that. It does. does. He He said, anytime you have a disturbance of soil, whether it be a, a mine or a hazardous waste site, or a dry lake bed, or road construction, the dust that gets blown up into the air is called fugitive dust. So we discussed the dangers of fugitive dust at a hazardous waste site. Uh And, And I literally had a show that night, it was a Saturday, and I had to pick up my car at the repair shop, which was a few miles out of town. So I got on my mountain bike. So I literally rode the bike rode rode the bike and wrote the song uh-huh. while i was yes. riding the bike because the, the 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 trail takes you out through the toxic soils yeah and i'm riding surrounded by wide open space because you're not allowed to build out there because the soil is so toxic and i would i i i started writing if you're ever in park city long ago the, t- the yeah. mines were bust the town was jumping, everybody was dumping, and now when the wind blows, yes. you got future dust. And I immediately put it into my into my phone, and I'd ride a couple hundred feet, and boom, I got another one. And like, I just wrote verse after I stopped my bike, and sing a verse, stop my bike, and I wrote like twenty verses. And then when I got home, I sat down at the piano, and put it to this kind of New Orleans um, gr- groove. And then we had a show that night and I brought the the mayor, the uh, candidate for mayor. This was right before the election. uh, Uh Two candidates for city council that all came out opposed to this hazardous waste site. This was front page news for weeks here. And they got up on stage and we did the song live that night twice. Uh Yeah. I even had a bag of uh, flour, and at the end of the song, I blew it into the air. <laughs> Which the people in the front row were not very happy about. Yeah, and yeah. We, we, finished, we finished the night, Now I said to my drummer, I'm going on tour in five days. We got to get in the studio now. So we booked the studio two days later, that Monday, mm-hmm. and we recorded all the tracks immediately, two days later. And the song was released within, I don't know, a month or two, and it got banned from the local public radio station. Did it really? Why was that? Was it just because of the they felt it was too hot, the, su- the subject matter? They said it was too hot, too political, and because the last verse I say, um, we'll have a drink at the Boneyard. Yes. Uh, because it's public radio, they claimed oh, they yes. couldn't mention a local business. I see. Some, something like that that's the like public, an excuse to me <laughs> it was it was lame i was not very happy so we contacted krcl radio station in salt lake city and they put us on and they entitled the interview the song too toxic for local radio i see yes <laughs> and i'm sure there's there's concern about that in salt lake city as well because there's concern about the great salt lake and and uh and the water levels i know that that's a that's a, a national story concerned about the water level so you know it, it is but it's there's going to be so much runoff we're now we've had so much snow i see now it's starting to melt so 
it's not going to fill all the way up, but it is going to keep it from being so toxic. So that's uh -huh. a good. But fugitive dust, fugitive dust is not just a Park City issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's I hope that song resonates with people all over that mm -hmm. they wake up to the dangers of um, what's going on around them environmentally. Yeah. yeah. Well, in a place that's, it, it's funny, a place that's as beautiful as, as the Rocky Mountains, there you run into, the, the concern for the environment is right there for people. So it, it, it can be easier to have the, open up those conversations. And op, which brings us to, to the single forgiveness, which is opening a, a different kind of conversation. Uh, Lisa, how did you feel when you heard the lyrics to that song? Did, did, did those, did it, did it work? I mean, <laughs> did, did, it, did it make a... Well, did it, change, did, it, did it change the way you were feeling? Um, we had gotten into an argument and um, it's funny, we were just answering some questions from an interview yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, and it said, what, how do you go about, you know, forgiving someone or what was the question? Um, if someone cuts you deep, how do you f forgive them? And, um, you know, we kind of hash it out. It's, it's like, I'm a yeller. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're not listening to me. And I get louder and louder. And Richard's like, stop yelling. So, so he does this backing away and I do this coming forward. So we both have to, we know that I have to pull back a bit and he has to keep coming forward a bit. Mm -hmm. So that's like. But what did you think of the lyrics is what it asked. Well, I'm getting to it. Okay. Um, so we got into a fight and we hashed it out. And it was coming down a bit and I just was like, I, I gotta go, you know, we need some space. So I left and when I came back in the Rich Wyman style like, that he always creates in, he went to the piano, he was angry and upset and um, wrote it all out. And by the time I got back, um, he said, I wrote something, you know, he was just so like, I want you to listen to it. And I sat down next to the couch and yeah, it was like a beautiful, it was like had somebody had written you an apology letter and just read it to you, but this yeah. was played it for me. So of course, you know, I, there were moments where I cried in it and moments where I laughed in it because sometimes when you connect words to in your lyrics, it, it can be pretty funny. And we mm -hmm. laughed and um, hugged afterwards and I loved it. Of, of course, I mean, who doesn't love a song written about them? Yeah. He writes songs about me all the time and it's just, it's beautiful. So yes, yes it was a good- And Fugitive Dust. <laughs> Fugitive dust is not about me. Lisa, do you return the favor? Do you write music uh, about your husband? Is, is or is it something that? Do you? Is... Well, yeah. You know, writing actually together is something newer. So we've only been doing it maybe seven years, um, and I had been writing some spoken word poetry and just writing a bunch of different stuff. At one point I was having downloads at four o'clock in the morning and was filling these journals with this crazy, I'd never really written poetry before, but it was rhyming. It was, I, it was amazing. And after like months of that happening, I created this poem and then I went, ah, oh, this sounds like a song. And I kind of put it in, doubled the um, chorus up again. And I went to him and I said, look, I need you. I, I wrote this song. I need you to write to this. We had never written together. Uh -huh. And uh, he was like, yeah, sure. And he put it down and started tapping around and um, came up with the most beautiful tune, figured out how to work the uh, words into it. It was the first song we had ever written together called... Um, behind my disguise. Uh -huh. And uh, then I was like, I've got more of those. And he's like, I got a lot of music that doesn't have any lyrics. Yeah, mm -hmm. bring them on. And I started 
sending him songs, well, poems that I immediately went up and reworked them so they so they read more like lyrics. And uh, we had written a handful, how many, like seven, eight, nine songs, which is off our first album, um, The Fearlessness. Yes. And then during COVID, we, I was like, I got more. And we just kind of, so, I mean, I, there are a lot of Rich Wyman songs, hundreds of them that I have not written on. Mm -hmm. But in the past seven years, we've been, um, we have created two albums worth of yes. music and we have found that we're, we're pretty compatible writing partners. Well, you had long, for a long time uh, been singing well, with the group for many years. You were you were doing yeah. You know. So when we when we lived in New York, I mean, I went to New York to study theater. I went to school mm -hmm. in Emerson, and when I moved to New York, um, I and studied, I do want to talk to you about your your show because I know you have a one. Well, I was studying method acting, and to me, because I had always been into theater, but singing had been my fallback gig. Mm -hmm. That was like. If the acting thing didn't work out, sure, I could sing and probably make some money. But the acting thing was at the top of the list. So I was studying method acting and uh, in some pretty intense um, courses. And then I met Richard and uh, we just started, I guess you described it as you heard me singing in the shower one day. Uh -huh. um, okay. What was that you? Uh... Well, I just the way I described it in that last interview was I remember I was I was just playing a song um, on my keyboards in my apartment in my apartment, and um, we had kind of moved in together at this um, point. She uh, she just started singing along, and she has an incredible talent for finding the most incredible harmonies. So the fire and ice thing is really nice, and mm. the and the, and the harmonies she comes up with are just ridiculous. And I just remember the first time she sang with me, I was like, whoa, that's incredible. Yeah. So then he, because he had a band and played around the city. Thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, he started bringing me up on stage. So we would, in the apartment, I would really start to memorize his uh, music that he had written, which I loved. Um, and he would start bringing me up on stage and I would sing harmonies. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how it started happening. I, I would say her, her voice gives my music a lift. Like, um, there's a song I wrote for a friend of mine a long time ago called Incredible Day. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he was in the hospital in a coma, and I wrote it for him the day he woke up. And uh, it's a very powerful song. And when I do it by myself, it, to me, it, it sounds flat, but I need Lisa singing on it now because yeah. she sings on the recording and it's incredible because people will come and see us play. And when they sing along, they don't sing the melody. They sing, they the sing, her, they sing her harmonies. It's incredible. It's funny. Well, but that's nice to be able to, I think a lot of people when you play solo want to sing with you, but when they sing the same note, there's something missing. So <laughs> when they can sing the harmony and they have no idea they're singing harmony, uh -huh. yeah. um, I think it's pretty magical. Yeah. So. Well, she, she it's, and that's one, you know, I wanted to bring her up to share the spotlight with me. Uh, you know, I look at, uh, I did 10 albums before we did our first duo album. Mm -hmm. And she sings on every one of those that I produced. Uh -huh. And the one that Eddie produced, she sings on. Um, the ones I did over in Europe, they used all European musicians. Um, but I realized going over my catalog, she deserves to, to come, out of the, come out of the shadows, you know? Yes. Well, also we had right around the same time we started creating songs we were like well let's do uh what what do you maybe we could someday we kept thinking someday do a duo you know like um our own stuff but on a, an album and then we became empty nesters and we were like gosh we have a lot more time oh yeah the kids were gone and uh let's start really focusing on it and we decided to become a duo uh-huh right so that's how yes. that happened 
but you've been on, uh, but you have been singing together for, uh, for. Oh, we've been together 35 years. Did you go to Europe uh, on those European tours in the 90s and 00s with with Rich? Were were you part of the group at that point or did you stay? No, they, uh, when he, he was going to Europe on tour. I mean, I would, we had a family at that point. So we had two boys and we fantasized about moving to Ireland and stuff like that. But there wasn't any money. So it was like, okay, so we're going to uproot and move and be completely out of our realm and broke. And it just didn't seem like it was a good idea. So, you know, he just, he kept going to Europe and we kind of brought our children. Yeah. I came on a few more visits, things like that. But yeah. Um, it can be very difficult. Um, it, it it is a rock and roll cliche, but it it is because it's true. When uh, when partners are on the opposite sides of the ocean, it can be very hard to to. It, it just uh, the longing and the the difficulty can overwhelm the fun of being on tour sometimes. Uh, not, yeah. Regardless of how much success Rich was having in Europe, it it might have been very hard for the both of you to do that, especially since you work well together musically. Was it like? Well, that- at that point, it was just Rich Wyman, him and, mm-hmm. you know, his band. So I was just, anytime he'd come back into town and mm-hmm. he'd have a gig, I'd get up and sing with him. Or if he was making an album. <clears throat> so, and those were always fun. But then, yeah, I think when we became Empty Nesters, we just, like a light went on and we thought, let's just do it together and see what it what it's like and it well, as, as i recall it was like we were getting ready to do the fearlessness mm-hmm. and i think you were even thinking about doing a solo thing and we basically had enough music between the two of us and mm-hmm. we decided why don't we just do it together and yeah because some of the songs that like the lyrics i had he put had the most i mean anyone out there go to Park 88, The Fearlessness, because there are some songs on there. I think we should just bring them back, re-release them because they're so magical. But I I stayed as the lead vocal. Mm -hmm. And so Rich would create this beautiful music. I would stay. So there are about four songs where I am lead vocals. And then the other songs um, where I had written lyrics, but they were more rockin'. And Richard was more of the um, lead vocal. Mm -hmm. And so we just decided, oh, let's do the thing like Fleetwood Mac. We'll just put our songs together on an album. And uh, then were you going to say we started working with someone who said, no, if you're going to be a duo, be a duo. Put her higher up on your songs and put him up on those songs and put Uh it all together. And we, it was such a confusing time. I don't know about you, but. Um, I don't think it was confusing. Well, I did. <laughs> I mean, you know, because the songs that were really more popular on that album were the songs that he was singing by himself and that were more rocking. Uh-huh. And so I wasn't really on those songs that much. So we had to go back in the studio and take my vocals that were backgrounds and it was so bizarre and bring them up. But then when they went up, they were still kind of in the background. So I just, it was a time where I was struggling to uh, be of equal footing on stage with him. I see, yes. Who He's had his complete solo career. So this feeling of I'm not worthy to be up there and this feeling of, wait, I'm not even loud enough anyway. So could you just turn me up? So I felt like I was always fighting to just get a little more space. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, not feeling worthy that I could even be on the same level as him. So of course you didn't feel anything because you were in your own world. (laughs) But um, yeah, that was probably some of the hardest stuff that, um, but I did have this person going, come on, get her up there. Let her be equal to that. You, and had, I was like, you had your advocate. Was that the producer of the record? Yeah, or? right. Yeah. That was me. Oh, no, no, that no. That was you. No, that wasn't you. That was Jonathan who was oh, saying, 
who was saying, <laughs> no, no, let's not do separate in one album. We're going to bring her up. It was, it was the three or four songs that were the most popular were the rocking ones mm -hmm. that he was on. So again, it was like, all right, here we're at the same spot again. So it, it just was really a weird time for me. And honestly, I kind of, since then, I'm, I've always felt like I have just have to keep, you know, am I worthy to be at this equal level with somebody who has worked his whole life? And who writes incredible music and who knows how to handle a crowd like better than anyone I know. Mm -hmm. And here I was moving from this support background, making it sound, you know, beautiful. But I was coming out in the forefront and I was like, no, yes, no. All right. It's my time. No. I mean, I mean it was just. It was crazy for me. There, there's a long rock and roll tradition of of uh, you know of couples uh, making music at, uh, more or less on equal levels. I mean, I think about Richard and Linda Thompson come to mind, or uh, mm -hmm. you know John and Beverly Martin, or were were in the, in the beginning of John Martin's career. And like, I guess there's always that that. Um, that question, especially if the um, if for whatever reason the uh, the male partner in the couple is better known or has a solo career before, whether the female partner in the couple is, it, you know, it, whether whether she's afforded the same respect. But one thing that I think is is very nice about the music that you've made together is that it really does seem like it's in dialogue. It really does seem like. I mean, forgiveness is a good example of a song where it really does seem like. It came directly out of a conversation and it really is about the relationship. So you can't really dissever that from the relationship, right? Like that is a song that where you are introduced yeah. to these two characters at once, which is part of what makes it cool. Because when you think about it, that doesn't happen that frequently. It doesn't happen where you get both characters at once. Usually it's one perspective or the other and, and the other person is kind, of, kind of imaginary, but you hear yeah. both voices and there's a lot of imagination and, and a lot, there's a lot of emotion in both of those voices so you're kind of in the middle of a, of a you you get a window into into a conversation and i think that that is what's cool about it is that is that you get that um so infrequently you you don't hear that very very often so it's like you know rich oh. you must have been thinking about that when you wrote the song to some degree that this was going to be a dialogue or this is something that that, that is going to be the two of you uh that, that she was going to have her say on the song one way or another like you know, I, I try to get my head out of the way when I'm writing, Tris, uh -huh. you know, it's totally for me, just get the head out of the way, let the song pour out of your heart. And I don't really think when I'm writing, it just kind of comes out. Um, so I wrote the song, really, it was uh, just me telling the story uh, about the situation and how I saw it. But it's, of course, once Lisa sings on it, then... You, you, like you said, it just opens it up mm -hmm. into oh, here are the two. The, they're both. I was I was telling the story that both of us were in. You know? Well, yeah, because there's that one part where you say, um, uh, "Just tell me if you're out with the what? What's that?" Um, oh yeah, just don't make me wait. If you're out, if you're out hanging out with the boys, whatever, give it to me straight. Oh yeah, so uh, I can't even remember the fight, but I'm sure it was like. Just, just tell me why. Why can't you just tell me? I we would have avoided this whole argument if you would have just said something. And so he threw that in from my point of view. I guess so. If you're hanging outside with the boys, just tell me what it, whatever it is. I can't even remember the words. Just give it to me straight. I'm singing on it, and I can't even remember the words. Just give it to me straight. So <laughs> you have uh, there was another song that you had written way back. Remember the Tina and Andy days when um, you you were in L.A., you were working with Eddie Van Halen and I was home. We were kind of trying to get pregnant, which was a crazy time. But um, you had written a song and it was from my point of view. Which I've done a few times. He got it on pretty close, not exactly close, but um, from my <laughs> point of view and it it just... It's, um, it's where we stand, I think. It's validating. Yeah, uh -huh. I think that was where yeah. we stand. 
it's really, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing like when you're in an argument and we both try to be validating. It doesn't happen right away, but to really validate the other person on, regardless if you think it's right or wrong, or if you think you're right, to just validate somebody's feelings, like yeah. it's okay to have those feelings, yeah. so let's talk about it. Yeah. Um, that's Alicia, important. Yeah. Alicia, you were not, did you go to Los Angeles during the time when, uh, when Fatherless Child was being made, were, were you were you involved in those sessions, or was that was the Van Halen chapter one where you were? No, I did. I did there? go there, and we hung with Eddie and Valerie mm -hmm. and their little guy Wolfie at their house. He was what four? Had they come to five? Park City? Had they just come to Park City and and seen you guys That's rocking? Awesome. Yeah, we or, met them in Park City. David Bertinelli, Valerie's brother is uh, one of my best friends. I was best man at his wedding. Uh -huh. And um, he just said to me one day, um, my sister's coming to town. You want to have dinner with uh, my sister? We didn't even know. And um, uh -huh. he was Valerie's brother. Well, at that, at that point we did. But for the beginning of our friendship, I didn't know his last uh -huh. name. For a long time. Anyway, so they, uh, I said, yeah. And um, we, uh, we had dinner with Ed and Val at a friend's house. And it was very, very laid back uh, i was sitting on the floor with valerie and wolfie who was just a baby at the time and uh -huh. ed was outside smoking a cigarette and i remember he came walking in and just you know a pair of ripped jeans and a flannel shirt and kind of mm -hmm. came over and sat down on the floor and this was all in park city and we all had dinner together we hung out we got to know each other very down-to-earth people mm -hmm. and i was like i got not only was i late for dinner but I had to leave early because I had a show that night and I invited them to come see me play. And they all came up to main street to this club I was playing at. And I just, I played a, one of my best sets ever. Uh -huh. And the place was, you have to right? word got out. This is pre cell phone. So word got out word of mouth. Yeah. The whole place just became a sardine can back. Everybody knew that, but yes. Okay. Right. Everybody knew right. Eddie was there and the t it was like, I had the hometown was cheering for me. They were singing at the top of their lungs. Uh -huh. They were clapping and screaming and it was a great, great, so I'll was, never forget it. It was like the town sensed it was an opportunity. Even oh, yeah. as much as you did, the town's it's like, well, here's an opportunity for a local, a, a local hero to connect with someone with a global yeah. profile, but were you were you a Van Halen fan at that point, or did you know their music, or were you? I, of course, of course, I, I saw I saw Van Halen when I was in high school mm -hmm. um, in Tampa, Florida, open up for the Rolling Stones, and I remember I pushed my way all the way to the front, and I was getting crushed, like you always do, and um, <laughs> I was right in front of Eddie, and it was an, an incredible show. I fell in love with. Eddie's guitar player. I knew he was just a master at the guitar. Um, and I, I I told Eddie this years later, there's only two, when I was like 14 years before that, there's only two musicians I've ever had dreams about. It was Rolling Stones and Van Halen. Uh -huh. And then I was at the Van Halen Rolling Stone show. And then when I was working with Eddie, he's got a big blow up picture of the back of the Diver Down record. Uh -huh. If you look at the back of Diver Down, it's a shot of them in front of this huge outdoor show. Yes. And Eddie said, I said, where was that taken? And Eddie said, that I know exactly. That was the only show we ever did opening for the Rolling Stones. Uh -huh. It was in Tampa, Florida. And I said, I was there. And then we got, I got up close <clears throat> and you can see me in the picture uh -huh. in the very front pushed wow. up against the stage yeah. on the back driver down so and then on top of that Tris, get this my record deal in europe was with a record company in a town in the netherlands called nijmegen mm -hmm. and when i got together with eddie and told him i was signing with a record company in nijmegen he goes that's where he that's where he was born yeah there were I so mean, many unbelievable the stuff that comes full circle it's like so he, was, he, was, he was blown away eddie was like i can't believe you're signing with a company in nijmegen uh-huh that was his hometown before they left 
to come to uh, the United States. Did you change anything about the way that you played or wrote because you knew that Eddie Van Halen was going to be working on the record? Did did that mean, did it make you want to... They were already written. Yeah. Well, uh, the songs that we started out, he was he loved my song, Just Might Make It, um, mm -hmm. Blinded by Pain, um, a, a few songs that I had already written. And... Um, he kind of chose the songs, let's work on these. Well, yeah, we I spent... See, yeah. After we met that night, we stayed in touch. We, he came back to Park City numerous times to ski and snowboard. And we, we started snowboarding together. Mm -hmm. uh, we started hanging together. And, <clears throat> you know, he basically said, I'll bring you into my studio. I'll bring in Andy Johns to engineer. And we spent the rest of that year doing pre-production. He would say, what do you got? And I'd play him a song that I'd written. And he would be like, I remember I brought him this song that had um, a lot of different sections. And he'd be like, that's like three or four songs, Rich. Uh -huh. let's, let's just pick, take this idea. This is a song right here. So we, and he's like, he really taught me songwriting, how to cut the fat off and kind of get to the heart of the matter and um, write songs that are more laser focused. As mm -hmm. Tom, Tom Petty once said, don't bore us, get to the chorus. Um, Eddie taught me, um, you know, really kind of focus on a few ideas for a song. And so we had the songs that we worked on that I'd already written. And we would sit at his piano in his living room, or we'd go up to the studio and sit at the piano in the studio. And we would just sit and I would play the songs and he would kind of say, okay, let's cut that off, cut this off, shorten this, whatever. Um, and then um, there were a few songs that I was inspired to write. Like I said, I'm inspired by people mm -hmm. I work with. So I wrote mm -hmm. some of what I would consider probably my best songs, um, a song called So What, which became my biggest hit in Europe, and Little Things, which was also a big hit for me in Europe. I wrote those while I was working with Eddie. Yeah. And he just flipped. I wrote Fatherless Child while I was working with mm -hmm. Eddie. And these, these to me are iconic songs in my catalog mm -hmm. that were inspired by working with Eddie and Andy. Um, I remember when I first played So What and Fatherless Child for Eddie and Andy, just the two of them sitting at the piano and they both put their arms up and they were like, goosebumps, goosebumps. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. oh my God, these are like the best songs you've ever written, Rich. So they they inspired that in me. Did did you feel? Um, I mean, your piano playing is, you know, you really can tell almost immediately from from the moment that you start playing on the record that you really you're very comfortable. You really know how to play the piano. Did did it make you feel more confident about? I mean, Eddie Van Halen comes out with a guitar and like. There's there's no shyness whatsoever. Where I think a lot of times when you're a singer songwriter, even when you're working in a blues context, you don't always want to be showy necessarily. Did it did it you feel like it gave you more license to really stretch your stuff as a piano player? Like here's this guy who's an incredible guitar player. He's never never shy for a moment. And you I think really, you know, as as your records go on, you know, I feel like more and more the the, you know, the piano becomes super central and you really show your stuff did, did eddie give you give you courage to really play like that oh yeah um mm -hmm. eddie eddie said more than once man i wish i could play like you uh-huh because uh, he played the piano a lot he, obviously you know eddie also played the piano if you listen good to good piano player yeah yeah like yeah. listen to right now yeah uh, if, uh, you know that song the piano that's a tricky piano part mm -hmm. um but he was always uh, encouraging the piano was he knew I could play the piano. And I had very, I had a lot of confidence in my piano playing. Um, you know, when the band came in, we, we laid down the tracks pretty quickly. The vocals are what he really spent day after day after mm -hmm. day, microscopically mm -hmm. analyzing and tearing apart in every syllable. And this right. was again, before you could, edit with pro tools and stuff so you had to get the take you couldn't fix it later so you know that's when i actually i would fly <laughs> yeah. in to do some background vocals and i'll never forget was it the ah 
Uh, blinded by pain. Blinded by pain, uh, which he does a ripping guitar solo on, all of them. Mm -hmm. um, he actually came into the studio with us, like he wasn't. He came out of the control room, came back, and all three of us, because he was like, "We need another voice on there," and we just did three part harmony with this. Ah, uh, ah! Uh, I mean, all three of us. It was just. It was such an amazing moment. Yeah. 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 He was very, very meticulous. Not so much my piano playing, like I could do a take and he'd be like, great. Um, the vocals, the vocals, vocals he, he was, he was yeah. extremely meticulous. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I wrote a, the, the day Eddie died, I wrote a song for him called One More Time. Because that's what he would say, you know, <laughs> until we get it right, do it one more one, time. Yes. And oh my God, he would just, yeah, that was him. It, you know, when just thinking about it now, the, the 90s were, at that point in the 90s, it was a funny time in a way for Van Halen because they were, they were really the, by some measures, the biggest band in the world. I mean, they were, they were selling out concerts all over the world. And those, all those albums that they did with Sammy Hagar were number one albums. Um, yet history hasn't always been kind to those records. And I think that For Unlawful Carnal Knowledge, which I think was 91, was, is a record that I think some, even some Van Halen fans aren't that crazy about it. They feel like that, that it, it was more formulaic than some of the other records. Um, and Eddie at that point was very, very, very hard to interview because he was such a huge star. So there's not a lot of access into how he was feeling. A lot of people don't know how he was feeling. Did you get a sense of any restlessness from him or 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 feeling that maybe the critical response to that record was about critical, you know, mm -hmm. what the critics said? Um, when I was working with him, it was a very um, tumultuous time in his life and their career. Yeah. Um, when I was working with them, Ed Leffler, who had been their longtime manager, I remember the day Ed Leffler died. Mm -hmm. um, I got to the studio and Eddie was in tears. The whole, the whole band wow. was there in tears. Um, and then they brought in Ray Daniels to manage them, who managed Extreme and mm -hmm. really, in my opinion, kind of leveraged that whole thing to get Gary Sharon to be the lead right. singer. Yes. It was a complete failure. It didn't um, work. It yeah. didn't work. All. Mm -hmm. And during that period, you know, before that was, and, and the band was breaking up. Um, Eddie kept talking to me, like, maybe you could be our next lead singer. Really? And, yeah. And yeah. he was like, but, but you don't, he's like, but you, you're at the piano. We need someone who jumps around in tight spandex pants and stuff, mm -hmm. you know? And he's like, and that's not you. Um, and uh, it, you know, it, it was, a, he, he had just gotten tongue cancer and had part of his tongue oh, removed. Yeah, there, were, there were all these uh, uh, horrible things that were going on. Mm -hmm. um, his cancer, the band breaking up, his manager passing away. Um, it was, uh, in a way, you know, I feel like maybe working with me was an escape for him. Yeah. You know, that he really I see that. Yeah. He spent, we worked together for like three years yeah. and it was, right during all of that it seems like it was a great working relationship because he was playing guitar on the songs and then he probably felt really great to see you go to europe and and have hits in europe it probably made him feel really gratified to see that happen yeah. somebody who he had a personal stake in um just feel like i mean it must have felt like an escape there's so much pressure when you're when you are when you talk to people who are at that level Part of the reason why they don't do a lot of interviews then is because they just don't have time and because psych there's no psychological space for it. it, it it's, it's, a, it's a lot, a lot of pressure. And, um, you know, it's cool. And uh, it, it's, it's cool that, that, that you were able to do that and that you can kind of hear it on the guitar that he played on the record. I was listening to it, that it, it feels very free. You know, it feels very, if he, he felt very, and I'm sure he was just as meticulous about his guitar solos as he always was. He probably recut them a million times, but it does feel very free in a way that maybe he wasn't feeling like he had that outlet at that point. One thing I always remember when he would be in, cause I was there a couple of times when he would go in and mm -hmm. play the guitar. He'd have a, 
cigarette sticking in the guitar strings, yeah. mm -hmm. and he'd have one in his mouth. <laughs> and he'd also have one in the ashtray. I yeah. saw him having three at a time. You know, it was it's <laughs> such a great visual. I was just like, interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, he, he definitely um, you know liked his cigarettes. <laughs> Lisa, he was a great did, guy, though. Did you ever think that that Rich would join? Van Halen or join with Eddie? Did, did, did that did that worry you? Did it seem like? No, I think I remember when, when Eddie had, I wasn't there, but when Eddie had said, you know, oh, lead, we knew we were looking for a lead. And I was like, tell him you can try getting away from the piano for a couple of years. Uh -huh. Why not? Just give it a shot. Mm -hmm. So it did seem exciting to you. It didn't seem like, oh, if yeah. I could see it going either way, I could see it also being like, oh, well, you know, we're trying to we're trying to have a family here. It'd be hard to be hard to have you on the road for years at a time. You know, I guess I just wasn't thinking of that. Yeah. I was kind of thinking, well, you know, shit. If he's on tour with Van Halen, we have the money to just follow yes. it or whatever. Yeah. You know, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, there, there were there were a couple times uh, the, that the Van Halen was working on stuff for their album balance that i was there i was there when they were recording balance which is kind of which is a, which is a, 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 a they were trying things for that record that that was an interesting they were, they were definitely experimenting in a way that they hadn't for the for the i think the prior two and there's there's cool songs on that record i like that oh, record. Yeah. oh yeah yeah um and i was in there when they were you know they'd say rich you know because i was there hanging out with david mm -hmm. and david left so i was like this this fly on the wall watching van halen work on this album and in hindsight one thing i wish i had said can i go jump on the piano yeah right <laughs> yes and like you don't want to do that because you don't want to presume but at the same no time, there was no way i could I, I remember saying no no don't 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 yeah. they never if they ask me to yeah yeah so i just kind of sat there listening you know um but man if i'd sat down and played with them i think yeah. uh i think that really would have worked <laughs> I, th I think it would have too. I mean, I think you're coming from musically similar places. You probably have similar backgrounds, which is probably why the relationship with Eddie went as well as it did. And like, you know, you can hear the the the, the rock influences there and in, in all the stuff that that you're doing right now. I mean, you you, you hear the, the you, know, uh, the, you hear the, the there's there's a piano balladeer influence that's going on. There's a theatrical influence. There's also a pretty heavy rock influence. And I do hear that, Lisa, I do hear that on, in your vocals. I know that you were saying before a couple of times that, you know, that, that you know, Rich was doing the rocking ones. But I mean, I definitely, when, when you do a lead vocal, you can definitely hear, I mean, maybe it's the raised on robbery thing. Maybe it's like, you know, you can, there, there's a, there's a court and spark raised on robbery. Uh, uh, I love that song. Yeah, I, 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 I would have guessed just because that's a that's a a song where a woman who you don't really think. I mean, she's jazz influenced. She's theatrical. You don't really think of her as a uh, as a rock singer. But then she steps up and does a great rock vocal. And I feel like some of the times when you step and do a rock vocal, it's it's kind of with the same confidence. You know, like you do feel that way. Um, do you, I got a rock side. Yeah, you do. Does it come out in the one? I wanted to ask you about the the show that you've been doing in Los Angeles. Does that? I mean, it's a show about midlife crisis. Does the rock side come out in that show? It seems like a midlife crisis rock is something. That you know, you know, it's interesting. Do. Most people think it's a singing show. There's no singing in it. No singing at all. So it's it's just the acting. And you said before that you were act. You started as. I mean, the second time I did it, everyone was like, "You're not singing in it. What do you mean?" Uh -huh. So I added like an acapella, just kind of little thing here and there. But mm -hmm. I'm finding that didn't work very well. So I'm kind of scrapping it again. But no, it's a it's a theatrical piece. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there's no there's no music in there. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's going back to my old theater days that I kind of, um, not saying I left, but, you know, performing more with Rich and then having a family yeah. and they're just, I kind of put the theater stuff down and uh, so I you had hadn't, always... you hadn't been doing any theater at all for, for a long time. And then not really. I mean, I had done a few things here. I had, um, I always, had my eye on writing a one woman show for some reason i just was obsessed with the solo show 
Um, I think when I left New York, I remember doing my last cattle call, which was like a four hour wait around the city blocks of New York City, where you just wait and wait and wait. And then when you get up to do your 30 second audition, you learn that they're looking for a brunette with brown eyes. And I'm like, yeah. I can't believe yeah. I wasted my whole day. So mm -hmm. I actually got really pissed off at the whole process. Mm -hmm. And I was like, here I am waiting in line to audition for someone to get a part, to read their stuff, to perform their stuff. And to, and I went, no, I'm going to do my own shit. I'm going to do my mm -hmm. own moment show. And I have my eye on that for 35 uh -huh. or more years. So I had done a one woman show 25 years ago in Park City and it was great. It had a lot of music it in awesome. it. awesome. And then, um, <laughs> but I never let it go. And I can tell you, I've, I've had filled journals just writing about uh -huh. it for the past 20 plus 30 years. So part of this, um, I'd been writing spoken word poetry, which was just weird because it was like, I'm not a spoken word poet, mm -hmm. but getting those downloads had made me realize, I, I guess I can write poetry. Mm -hmm. And so I just started writing and writing for years. And there was this one poem called My Beautiful Midlife Crisis. And it was me I have this had this idealistic way of looking at, ah, I'm just, I work on myself so much. I'm so enlightened when I have a midlife crisis, it's going to be good. It's not going to be all the negative shit you hear about. And so I wrote, you know, when I grow up, my midlife crisis will walk down the runway wearing shoes designed for her feet. So it's this whole idealistic way of this woman who has this midlife crisis. And I, during COVID, I thought, I, I just have to memorize it. Maybe that'll be one step in a direction towards, I don't know, maybe I'm going to be this spoken word poetry, poet. I had no idea. Uh -huh. So every day I memorized and memorized, and it's a 12 minute poem. And I finally, like a year and a half ago, had a friend videotape it. I called her up and I said, look, can you just come over? I need you to film this with your phone. Just could you just do this for me? Did it, sent it to another friend who was living in LA who was <coughs> doing uh, solo shows. And I said, what do you think of this? And she went, for a middle-aged woman talking about a midlife crisis, I said, she said, that will fly. Uh -huh. She said, talk to my friend who's a director, sent it to her. And then she, for a whole year, helped me develop it. And she said, Hey, all I need to know is why you wrote that poem. Uh -huh. And so in telling her about the poem, she went, that's the one woman show. I see. Is your story. And let's break up the poem in four different places, end it with the poem, begin it with the poem. And then in between is the show. And I went, Oh, okay. So she helped, I would write it. She would help me cut the fat and say, mm -hmm. oh, I think you should. And she would constantly say, yeah, but what, what's, uh, I need something deeper. What, what, what happened with you and Rich in that place? And I was like, oh, I don't want to go there. <laughs> she was like, that's the shit that people want to hear. Mm -hmm. You got to, are you bleeping me? Am I not allowed to say things like that on this no, podcast? No, you're, you're not. I don't think you can. Oh, good. Oh, my gosh. Now that I know that, my jersey can come out. I can be like uh potty mouth, but I won't. Um, and so we worked on it for a year and mm -hmm. she said, do you want to do one show or do you want to do the solo circuit? Mm -hmm. And I went, what's the solo circuit? So this whole 20 plus years of not really doing theater, I had no idea there was this huge wave of people who just do solo shows. Uh -huh. And she said, oh, the solo circuit, you can go all the way LA, New York, you can even go to um, Edinburgh, you know, festival. And I said, I want to do the circuit. Uh -huh. And so, yeah, we, I've done two shows in LA and they're solo festivals. 
And uh, the first one was great. Richard had no idea what I was writing. I wouldn't share anything with him. Oh, was it, totally, was it? it was shocking. <laughs> oh, but you liked it. You liked no, it. No, of course I loved it. It actually was said a lot of great things about him. It wasn't yes, it was. negative stuff. <laughs> but um, yeah, I did it the first time. Then the second time, um, and this third time, I realized I had to cut it down to an hour, which is not easy. Mm -hmm. And then I had a knee injury. I fell, shattered my kneecap, had surgery oh. three weeks ago. So I'm canceling this June festival, which would have been three shows in LA. How are you feeling yeah. now? Is, is, the knee, is the knee on the mend? It's on the mend, but I didn't want to have to. Yeah. You know, when you have a trauma like that and then surgery on top of it, it's like yeah. the last thing I want to do is work on memorizing lines and cutting mm -hmm. a show down. So I just canceled it and I'm glad I did. She'll be but, back in the fall. Uh huh. Yeah. I, I think the popular, yeah, the popular conception of midlife crisis is something that a certain kind of man has uh, and that the way that it's expressed is by doing things that he did, starts doing things that aren't age appropriate. Um, I think that well, a lot of times when people think about midlife crisis, that's what they think about. Uh, but it seems like you have a different way of thinking about midlife, uh, about what a midlife crisis is and when it happens. Well, it brings what's it weird is I wrote that poem and then it was almost like this precursor to what was going to happen. Because uh -huh. in 2020, and I'll say this fast because we need to leave by around in like a couple minutes, I okay. had my first physical therapy session. Oh gosh, yes, um, good luck with that. Yeah. So uh, in oh. 2020, I was doing this intense meditation course online um, and it was a lot of Kundalini yoga stuff and I knew it was gonna take me to a, a level. Mm -hmm. And something happened in there where I had this major spiritual awakening. And it messed me up for like a year and a half. Mm -hmm. It, I mean, I was a crazy woman to him. I, I even dragged him to therapy and said, I'm losing my mind and you have to know why I'm losing my mind. And I have to know why I'm losing my mind. And so the midlife, the show is about what happened in 2020 and how I came through that, I don't even know if I'm still out of it and it's been uh -huh. three years, but how I've worked my way through that um, and how we dealt with it together. Um, and I, it's just, it's kind of a light comedy show. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think everybody kind of lost their mind in 2020 and I don't think anyone Absolutely. knows for sure was, if, they, if they got Rich their minds back, yeah, yeah. Rich goes to the piano <laughs> to write out all of his shit. <laughs> I now realize now that I've kind of gotten back into theater, it's like I go on stage to get yes. the shit out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I write about it. <laughs> well, listen, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, it's great. It's great to meet the both of you and to talk about your music and well, good luck in physical therapy. I, I know that can be that can be a real chore, but you know, they always tell you to like do your physical therapy, make sure you do it. That's the most important thing. It's more important than like whatever doctor tells you to do. So like, right. Well, well thanks for having us. We appreciate yeah. meeting you too. I, I appreciate talking to you and I'll continue listening to your music and please, I'm sure you'll continue to, to keep Andy and everybody at hip um, apprised of everything that you do. And uh, oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to the next thing. Uh, it, it's exciting to hear your music. Um, and uh, it's it's just so well put together and thought out, and uh, and uh, I appreciate the time that you spent talking about it. And it's good to talk about Park City too; it's a fascinating place. Yeah. Well, if you ever come, we've okay. got an extra room. Okay. All right. Absolutely. You're always welcome, Tris. It's been nice talking to you. Yeah. Nice thank to you. you too. Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay. Bye.